Um, I am making notice that we, um, as a board, met in executive session to talk about some personnel and legal matters. Um, and I'll move now to the first round of public participation. Anyone here can speak on any issue, um, Radnor residents, for up to five minutes. Um, if you're here for an item that's on the agenda, you can choose to wait to speak during that time. Uh, anything that we vote on will have an opportunity for public comment. But those of you who would like to now, um, this is an opportunity to talk about any issue, whether or not it's on the agenda. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my comment uh, today concerns Can the, you do uh, your, your name and address? Oh, of course. Uh, my, uh, my, my name is Jillian Norris Santo, address 424 Inverary Road in Villanova. And I'm president of the League of Women Voters of Radnor Township. And I'm, uh, my comment tonight is on the uh, forthcoming primary election, May 16th. And uh, it concerns that, and as you know, the uh, Radnor, the Radnor League uh, appreciated and does appreciate the time and work that the whole Board of Commissioners devoted to, that uh, the League appreciates the time and work that the Board of, Commi Board of Commissioners devoted to the reapportionment process over the past few months. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, our comment now concerns the next step. We would like to ask that the Board uh, reinforces the fact that the current ward lines will still be in effect for the May 16th primary. Uh, there might be some confusion, some uncertainty, among Radnor residents, Rad uh, voters, about where exactly uh, they are to vote in May in the primary. They've probably been following this and they've heard that there have been some changes to the ward lines. Uh, the, uh, the Board of Commissioners approved changes to the lines, the ward lines, as you know, I think in December finalized them and passed them along to the uh, Bureau of Elections for approval. However, these changes will not be in effect in time for the primary uh, next month. Uh, they may be uh, most, most likely, probably, we hope, in effect for November, but that's another, I guess, another bridge to cross. So I think that um, if the commissioners or the township, I guess the commissioners, could inform the residents that the current existing ward lines will still be in effect, and voters should vote in their customary uh, polling places and wards, um, we think this would be a great help uh, in making the primary election successful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any other public comment at this time? So I'm going to move on to the consent agenda. This is another opportunity for public comment. If you um, have any item on this consent agenda, item A or B, that you'd like to remove, um, would like to make a comment on, uh, please step up. I'm not seeing any. Is there any item that a commissioner would like to remove from consent agenda for discussion? Okay, um, I am going to make a motion to approve the consent agenda. May I hear a second? Second. Uh, all in favor say aye. It passes unanimously, five of us. Okay, moving on to our business agenda. The first item is uh, caucus, which is uh, we won't be voting on. It's final minor land development plan. It's a two lot subdivision at 317 Ivan Avenue, right next door. If you'd like to come up. Hey, Commissioner, I'm just going to give a little lead in if you don't mind. So this is the property right next door to the township building. Uh, the applicants requesting two waivers, one for the 500 foot mapping, which is very common that the board always approves or often approves. The other is for curbing, which through the planning commission process we determined was not needed for that property. Also want to mention uh, the developer did uh, at our request will provide a connection to our parking lot so folks can get over to the playground. That'll come in through our little, thank you very much. And also, uh, since this is a two lot minor subdivision, uh, this would also 
qualify, if you will, for a uh, preliminary final approval. There's not a lot here. The review letters are clean. They're still going to have to wait for their sewer approval. During that time, they will work with staff to clean up those letters and get the plan ready for approval once the, uh, once the sewer approval comes in. Thank you, Mr. Norsini. Yeah. All yours. Good evening. My name is Julie Bernstein. I'm with Kaplan Stewart. Uh, we're the attorneys for the applicant. So Steve gave a decent overview of kind of the main points here. So uh, um, just to orient you, uh, it's 317 Ivan Avenue, which is literally the next door property. Um, it previously had been improved with a single family dwelling that was in pretty poor condition. Um, it's located in the R3 residential district, which allows single family dwellings. Can you pull the mic to your mouth? Which allows single family dwellings on 10,000 square feet. So, here, this is a minor um, subdivision to split the property in two um, conforming lots. One's 14,000 or just over 14,000 square feet, the other one is just shy of 14,000 square feet, and each will be improved with a single family dwelling, as well as modern improvements such as stormwater management system, which doesn't currently exist on the property, um, as well as going back and forth with the Planning Commission. Um, they're going to install a sidewalk along the frontage, which will then connect to um, the lot right here, which some of the neighbors indicated that children like to walk over to the township property. So this will um, connect that. Um, we are, as was mentioned, asking for two minor Waivers, we did provide Ariel's um, vicinity plan with that um, proposal, which does give you a good idea of what um, is within the 500 square feet, so it's not really a full waiver, just a partial. Um, and then also, as was discussed, we're not putting in the curbing. Uh, finally, I just wanted to briefly mention that um, uh, the ordinance does provide that Ivan's a minor collector, so it would need a 60 foot right of way and 36 foot cartway. It's at the board's discretion to ask for um, us to come into compliance with this. We are providing the 30 foot right of way in front, um, but the existing cartway is 22 feet and uh, we're proposing not to change that. Um, with the planning commission, it was discussed and understood that we wouldn't be or there would be no opportunity to widen the road further up the road because of the natural features so you would be just widening right in front of this house which would create kind of a strange bump in the road um, and the planning commission we don't feel that that really is in the public safety and the public interest to kind of create a bump right there um, it's not really a waiver, but to the extent you felt that way, we are also asking not to widen the road right there. Um, and then finally, there were just some comments in the, um, the final review letters, which are really clean. Um, they were about landscaping, but we did submit a new landscaping plan, um, provides street trees. We're also actually providing a buffer um, between the property and this property um, on our side. Um, the tree replacement, being proposed exceeds the ordinance requirements so it should be a really nice kind of landscaped set of properties um, and you know the proposal is to make it look really nice and improve this area again the house that was there was in pretty poor condition it was recently demolished after we received uh, zoning relief to remove the man-made steep slopes that were kind of propping up the existing home there um, so that's, I guess, it. I have Scott Emerson. He's the um, owner's representative with me. And uh, Dave Gibbons of D.L. Howell. He's the engineer on the project, if you guys have further questions. But we are seeking uh, preliminary final approval. I have a couple questions. Um, so it's going from one lot to two lots, correct? Or correct. Okay. And um, the bedrooms for the house that was, I guess, condemned or knocked down, how many bedrooms did that have? Um, Bedroom, bath, square footage. Do you have an idea? Four. Um, four. Okay. Four uh, bedrooms. How many baths? Do you know the square footage? Of the old house? Yes. Yeah, the old house. Can you uh, step to the mic to answer the questions? Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm going to guess. I mean, I think just. Uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be. Exact. Yeah, about 2,700 square feet, maybe. Okay. And the new houses that you're, that you're putting up, how many bedroom, bath, square footage? And are they going to be pretty much the same? 
I mean, they look identical. There'll be a larger footprint. Um, there'll be four, be four bedrooms, and I believe they're going to have three baths. We're still working on architecture right now. Okay. And do you have a, an estimated price of where your sweet spot is on the pricing side? Uh, and, and, and what, while I'm asking is because that comes up or that came up in a similar area um, on Radnor Chester Road right around the corner. Um, they were putting two houses versus three houses. And so just curious if you have an idea, a general ballpark of where you think you're going to price this. They're, they're going to be over the million range, million-ish. Again, we're figuring that out once we yeah, figure the architecture. With me. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, commissioners? Can, can, can you just walk through and explain that access to to the park again? Um, not not clear where that uh, that road's going, or is it or is it a sidewalk? It's a sidewalk, so it's that a si sidewalk's just going to lead you to the entry to the township building. So you're still going to whoever's going to the park is still going to have to cross an entryway, correct? The yeah, commissioner. Yes. So we just. This came up at Planning Commission. We discussed it for, for some time, uh, putting in the sidewalks, and then all we asked for was the connector to our lot. And then those folks who connect, just like everybody else who parks and walks over the playground, that's how they would access. Okay, I understood that. That uh, I, I, I get it now. Um, and then on the the tree skate plan, are, are those 14 trees of the same species? Um, there is, <coughs> there's a variety of species that are proposed. Um, we have ginkgo, we have uh, oaks, willow oak, white oak, Japanese cedar, norway spruce, cherry laurels. But in that corner where it's the, the 14 grouped together. Right here? Uh, yeah, are, are, are those all of one species? These are all the same species, yes. Um, what we were asked to do was to provide a screen of the parking lot um, at the request of the township. So when we were putting our buffer plan together, um, we felt that was going to make a pretty good uh, dense screen from the uh, any lights that would be coming from cars to be parking there. And, and Steve, there was no there was no uh, concern with the shade tree committee on uh, on grouping it like that. If one was to get diseased, they'd all die. So uh, I'll ask the developer: Are they arborvitae or something along those lines? These are the Japanese uh, cedars. Okay. So uh, commissioner, I wasn't at that shade tree commission meeting. Um, so I, uh, that I can't tell you, but it's very common when they're trying to put up basically a wall that there would be a line of arborvitae or a double stack line of art. And in this case, you know, the Japanese cedars. So uh, I think they have a good mix on the property so as not to have the monoculture. I know that's what you're concerned about. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't have a concern. I mean, I'm not the shade tree commission, but okay. I don't have a concern with the, with what they're doing for screening for lights. Okay, and is, is there current activity at the property? Like I drove by and I, I mean, it looked like some activity had already started. What's, what's going on there now? So, so the existing home that was there, the dwelling, was recently raised. Okay, yeah. okay. all right, thank you. I have a couple questions about um, the placement of the two houses on the lot seem to be kind of evenly um, spaced. What goes down the middle? Is that a shared driveway between the two homes? Is it um, just the property line? Where, like, where do the cars go? Uh, so we're not, there's no shared driveway. We just have the property line separating the two lots. Driveway for lot two comes in this configuration. Driveway one comes in this configuration. And they have garages? Yes, both have two car garages and a driveway with a turnaround. And they also have pull offs on the driveways as well uh, coming up, these little bump outs. So for any trucks or delivery vehicles, they have area turnaround. And I think you have a, a traffic study done. Can you speak to that? What did they find out? We had a sight distance study done, yes. And uh, so we, these have um, been determined to meet the uh, requirements 
based on the posted speed limit. I don't have any other questions. Yeah, j just one more, um, and because this is this came up before, and I, I want to prevent it um, from happening again. Have have you, or has, is the township aware? Have they designated housing numbers for these two units? Uh, if you're you're referring to addresses, yep. uh, we have to get those from the township. So we we won't, we'll get one extra number. So the number, as I understand it, will still be 317. I don't know what the other one's going to be. The township will determine that. But once we have it, it gets placed in the plan uh, prior to getting recorded. Okay, but they're both not going to be 317 A and B or whatever. No, okay. I, I don't like doing it that way. Okay, good. Thanks. Any other questions from commissioners? I have uh, one question, and I know you went through um, Shaytree. I did not get to see the meeting. Um, when you are making a selection of the type of trees, um, what goes into that planning? And I'm leading to, do you consider n native trees to be priority over um, you know, decorator trees? Does that come into play? Um, <clears throat> when our landscape consultants uh, and architects put these plans together, they take um, consideration into the health, the long-term viability of plants. Um, they're also, the species are, what are they going to do? Are they deciduous? Are they supposed to be street trees, supposed to be vine buffers? Um, those are also worked in with the township, and typically with the township um, has recommendations for those plants. Sometimes we can't get exactly what it is, so you have substitutes, but they're all basically what um, the township would want to have uh, as a species placed on these plans. So that's when we work back and forth with the township on that and come up with the final plan set that you see here. Thank you. Um, and one last, are either of these houses going to be owner-occupied or are they being built to go on to the market for sale? They're both going to be for sale. Other questions, commissioners? Jim? Um, when, when you took down the house, and I noticed when I drove by all the trees, I think a lot most trees are gone. Do you guys remember how many trees there were? Um, I go back to the calculations. We had to do tree replacements. Um, prior to them um, being taken down, we had a uh, arborist come and do a health assessment on those. So they weren't taken down just to be taken down. They were compromised. Uh, the one viable um, tree that's there, which I believe is a spruce, uh, that remains, that's still protected. All the other ones had been determined to have some kind of health uh, issue. Um, some were already dead and some were in decline. Could you, maybe it would be good for the board if you just step through the results of the, the shade tree meeting that you attended and how it reflects on the plan? One of the, <clears throat> when we had met with the Shade Tree Commission, one of them was um, discussing the trees that were proposed to be removed um, for the subdivision. Uh, as I mentioned, with the study that was done by the arborist, um, played a role into uh, what was going to be taken out and how we we're going to come up with calculations of what had to be replaced. So what we're seeing here is a result of the study, the recommendations, and making sure we're meeting the replacement requirements um, that are required by the township. Um, subsequently, we had added uh, street trees, um, and we had also added the buffer to the um, uh, parking lot and from our property. Um, I believe it was a relatively standard meeting. I mean, other than presenting what we were proposing to do, what we were proposing to retain, and then how we're going to meet the uh, township ordinances. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. So moving on to um, item B on the business agenda, DVRPC Regional Streetlight Procurement Program, the LED Street Lighting Feasibility Study Presentation by Keystone Lighting Solutions. 
Thank you, Madam President. If I could, I'll just uh, give a quick intro. Um, we have here tonight Mr. Michael Fuller with Keystone Lighting Solutions. Um, the township, through Melissa's efforts last year, reached out to DVRPC, who is working in conjunction with Keystone and mm -hmm. coordinating um, street light improvements throughout the greater Philadelphia metropolitan area. And I think in the past three years, somewhat close to 70 municipalities they've worked with in converting their street lights over to LED. Um, we've, we've had several conversations and meetings and tonight uh, Mr. Fuller here is, is here to present uh, the next step in the process. Um, this ties in with our clean energy plan as adopted by the board to reduce our energy consumption, move towards clean energy, uh, and Mr. Fuller will present an overview of the project, the scope, the estimated cost, um, our savings, and projected return on investment. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. So I'm gonna go through a presentation. I'm not gonna hit on every slide in the presentation. There's actually a 40-page feasibility study that sits behind this presentation, which we're not gonna go through. So I'm gonna hit the highlights here, but you do have more information provided to you. So first of all, uh, we're gonna talk about the Regional Street Light Procurement Program. This, this is a program that was developed by DVRPC over seven years ago at this point. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a moment. But the reason that municipalities are looking to upgrade uh, their LED, their street lights to LED technology is primarily the first two reasons here. Um, it is to reduce your energy consumption by 50 to 75%. Obviously, that generates uh, both financial savings, but it also helps with your clean, uh, clean energy goals of just reducing uh, energy consumption. Uh, and then you're also gonna reduce your maintenance costs by a similar percentage because of the long life nature of LED. There are many other benefits that we'll talk briefly about. Um, they're more controllable. They put the light where you want them. You can uh, dim them to a certain specified level. Uh, so it gives us a lot of flexibility to design really the perfect lighting system. Um, whereas right now you probably have a, you know, a system that's been in place for 20, 30, 40 years it's less standardized at this point. This is our opportunity to kind of get it back in line and really performing uh, as it should as a roadway lighting system. The one nice thing about our projects are they do give you a return on investment. So there are savings generated from this project. Those savings are going to pay for the project over time. So unlike many other things that you have to do, uh, paving, other things where you have to spend the money, uh, but you don't necessarily get a financial return, this one pays for itself over time, and you'll see that in the financials that we show you. DVRPC created this as a turnkey program, so they really wanted to, uh, the mission was to help municipalities that otherwise um, maybe didn't have the technical resources or didn't have the, uh, the opportunity to get with other municipalities to lower and leverage the scale and get the pricing down on these types of projects. So every municipality has different reasons that they've entered, but generally, uh, DVRPC basically provides everything associated with the initial feasibility, the design, the project management, uh, dealing with the utility, getting rebates, all those types of things. Uh, it's all covered by the program. Um, so, and just to give you a, a little background, uh, Keystone Lighting was selected by DVRPC in round two of the program as the design professional. And uh, we've been involved since then, and we actually were the technical advisor in round one also, so we've been involved all the way through and we're competitively selected uh, from a national search of firms. Uh, uh, round one, round two results, I'll just summarize, um, that we have touched over 70 municipalities so far. Some are in, still in construction at this point, uh, but generally we've generated great results, uh, not only in terms of uh, energy savings uh, financially, but also in terms of um, uh, greenhouse gas reductions from the reduced energy consumption. Many of these uh, municipalities are your neighbors um, that have either done the program or are doing the program right now. I'm gonna go past this. I'll just mention briefly, one of the biggest benefits, it's all part of the turnkey approach, but one of the biggest benefits is leveraging the scale of all these municipalities. We have shown that we are buying uh, the product and the installation services at a much lower rate than you could if you were to just go 
and attempt to do this on your own, any given municipality. Um, so we have uh, assessed over the different rounds that we continue to provide um, well below market level type pricing on, on this project. So just to give you an idea of where we are, we're in the feasibility phase, so the very first uh, phase. This is a free study that you've received. DBRPC has paid for this um, uh, feasibility study, and this is just to give you an assessment of what the opportunity is. We haven't gone out and looked at all your uh, street lights at this point. That's part of the design phase, which is what you'd be deciding uh, if you take action uh, this evening if you want to move to the design phase. That's the only decision you're making at this point. We're going to talk about a project, but it's all just a general uh, assessment of what the project could look like based on our experience and the information you've provided us uh, thus far. Uh, if you move into phase two, that's the proper design phase. And we actually, uh, the biggest step of that is right away we would actually bring in auditors. We do a GIS-based audit. So we will locate every single street light. We'll now know exactly where it is, what it is, and how we can upgrade it most appropriately. Even if you were not to continue on to construction, you actually would get all that GIS data of your existing lighting system. That in itself is of uh, great value. Plus you get, with that GIS audit, then my firm's able to do the design and apply standardized designs for roadway lighting that have worked very well for all these other municipalities uh, where we've implemented this. Of course, uh, phase three would be construction and phase four goes along with that. It's really just post-construction getting the utility bills making sure they're updated appropriately, making sure you got your rebates, you got documentation on the project, pretty straightforward. But phase two would be your next uh, decision to make if you wanna go on to the design phase. So again, this is a feasibility study. We just used the information that was available to us, primarily uh, PICO bills and some other uh, uh, local knowledge that you have of your streetlight system. But again, we haven't done any audits up to this point. Uh, there's a very large study document that's been provided um, associated with this. I just have a couple slides to give you the scope of what the project looks like. So of your uh, 1,350 uh, streetlights that you have, uh, over 1,100 of them are the classic Cobra Head utilitarian streetlight uh, that you see there on the left. Uh, this is what we would do is we would replace this old head put the new head, the arm stays. Um, it's, it's still connected to the same pole. We only rewire if it's unsafe. That's the only time we need to put in new wiring. Uh, so hopefully the wiring's good and we uh, just put the head on and the new LED uh, street light is ready to go at that point, okay? I did mention we use standardized designs. Here are some of the wattages we use. Uh, we'll get into a lot more of those technical details in the design phase. But again, it is a standardized lighting system with different light levels for different types of roads. Locals, collectors, and majors all get different levels of light as you would expect. You also have 183 of these four-sided colonial uh, fixtures. And basically, we would once again be taking that head off, keeping the pole, and uh, putting a new LED head on top of that. And it's a uh, really quick change out and it's the, the appropriate way to do this type of change out. Um, some have tried to do just a relamp of that with like a LED bulb. It's just not a really good long-term solution. So this uh, luminaire is fairly cheap relatively to replace. So it's better to just replace the whole head and put in something that has a much longer warranty and performs much better than a, some sort of simple little retrofit uh, solution. You also have 38 of these um, shoebox, we call these shoebox fixtures. They could be replaced with, um, uh, similar to the Cobra head, but it's more square and we, we get it in dark bronze so it matches what was there before. Again, we're, this is feasibility phase. In the design phase, we could look at this closer. I think this may be a community that um, talked about, could this even be changed out to a different type of uh, uh, luminaire? And that may be a possibility, but we'd need to get to the design phase to figure that out, but, and so we have a very standardized set of solutions that we bring, but it, the end project ends up being customized based on your input and what you're looking for, um, for applications like this, or if there's areas where you feel you need a little more light or a little less light, we do take those into consideration. Even though the bulk of the project really is a one-for-one -one replacement of your existing, we do tend to do a little bit above and beyond that. 
We also, um, we get into a lot of detail in, uh, in the design phase with this, but you do have options with LED to uh, now have control systems associated with them. You could not dim the old style technology, uh, HID street lights. These you can dim, which gives you the ability to really design to a very specific level, have different strategies with uh, when the lights come on, at what level they come on, and you know how long they stay on at different levels. So, but the primary reason that people look at these more sophisticated control systems, which would be an adder above the base solution to the project, is uh, it proactively tells you where you've got outages or, or what we call day burners, ones that are d burning during the day, or you have a Pico outage, or a car hits a pole and you get a tilt uh, alarm. All those types of things can be reported immediately back uh, to the township, so you can be very proactive in your maintenance of your uh, lighting system. These currently, uh, these uh, decorative fixtures are currently, um, oh, these are included in the feasibility study. Uh, when we get into these more expensive style fixtures, we do use a high uh, grade retrofit kit. I mentioned a kind of cheaper version before. This is a really a good quality one with a long warranty and really has silicone around it that makes sure that's not a glare bomb uh, inside that fixture. So there's 18 of those that we would do retrofits. And then this is currently not in uh, the feasibility study just because we didn't have sufficient information. We would get more information during uh, the design phase. But these are some of your streetscape um, uh, fixtures. Again, in phase two, this could be, uh, we would look at this more cl uh, closely and see if we, what we could do with that. And I know these uh, not only go along, I, I was showing it between Wayne and Aberdeen, but I know it goes off some of your side streets also into like a business district, uh, the Wayne business district. And, you know, so we would look at that more closely in uh, the design phase. And then there are, currently Pico believes you have a bunch of incandescent traffic signal lamps. We wouldn't know until we did the audit. They could possibly all be LED and just the information hasn't been reflected on your bill. We would figure that out, and if they are incandescent, we'd upgrade them to LED, but at a minimum, we would get uh, your PICO bill reflecting uh, all the LED that either are there or that we would install in the project. So um, I'm just gonna skip a couple slides, go to the financial summary. So the base upgrade, which is not any special controls or anything, um, this, after the rebates have been uh, factored in, you do get rebates. This would be about uh, $545,000, uh, but you can see that it's generating uh, estimated $100,000 per year. This is a 5.3 year payback. Uh, after you've kind of recovered your project costs, uh, then you're just getting $100,000 per year in savings. That's money that can be applied to other projects, other needs for the township. Uh, there, I didn't go into detail on it, but there's, there's kind of a simple uh, control option. It's, we, it's a manual control option. It generates similar savings and costs a little bit more. So these two are really very close to each other uh, in terms of results. The sophisticated control system, um, that does cost more, but you get a lot of different uh, capabilities with that. That would take you up to, uh, after rebates, about $900,000 estimated at this point. It does generate more energy savings because you're on a better tariff with Pico, um, and that would be uh, an eight and a half year payback. Again, you're not being asked to decide on anything at this point. This is just to give you a sense of what the options will be and things we'll talk about more in, uh, in the design phase. This is more detailed, same numbers, but just some breakouts there. I'm not gonna go through that. Uh, so the next steps, just so you know what happens in phase two, as I already mentioned, we start with the investment grade audit, we do design, uh, we apply the procurement, we are continually working on the procurement to see if we can even lower costs more, but it's already at a very low level. We uh, lock in rebates for you. Um, we actually would lock in rebates in this uh, program year, which are a little bit better than what we anticipate come June. So we can lock those in now if you move to, uh, the second phase, but we, the point is we handle all that for you. We, we deal with PICO to do that. And then we would present you with the final project design and then you would decide if you wanna move on to construction. So the next steps are really 
Um, I'm available to answer anything on the feasibility study that we've put together so far. Uh, and really, the, we do have it on as an action item, I believe, right after this presentation if you want to move on to the design phase. Again, the only thing you're uh, committing to is going into design. You're not committing to any project at this point. The forecasted uh, design fees for uh, that phase two design is $36,000, which includes uh, Keystone lighting fees, but also DVRPC fees. They, they have program fees baked in that we actually bill for them because they don't have a good mechanism to do it. Uh, we do that for them, but that's what you would be committing to at this point by moving into uh, the second phase of, of design. We would uh, kick off phase two for all. Uh, we have five municipalities uh, right now in, uh, in this round, and all will have made decisions in the coming weeks as to whether they're moving on to phase two, which allows us to uh, kick off the design phase for everybody in May. So auditing would start in May right away, probably go into June, and then we would want to come back, have your final design uh, pulled together to present to you sometime later in the summer to decide if you want to move on to construction. We, we're hopeful we can still install uh, this year if we get end of summer uh, decisions on construction. We'll order materials right away, and uh, um, then we'll be installing you know, in the fall and later in the fall into the early winter. So that's what I have for you today. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure we've got some questions from the board. Um, Commissioner My Myers, you want to go? Yeah, thank you very much. That was a really great presentation. I have to admit, I read it before you. Did, okay, so. good. <laughs> um, a couple of quick questions. Tell us, if you can, mm -hmm. um, who around here has already had this completed, just so we can drive around and look at the lights. Sure, I, I think <laughs> the biggest example is Tradifferent. Mm -hmm. um, they're the largest. The whole township? The whole township. Right. Yeah. When we do, everybody who's participated, they do the entire municipality. Uh, so Tredifferin, um already did it. Uh, I, I do have to apologize. I'm from State College, so I don't, I don't know all the neighbors perfectly. Um, Newtown Square Township right below you, they've already done it. Um, I could get you a full list, but it's... That's fine. I, yeah, Tredifferin's want, probably I'm the best. I'm close to Tredifferin, so that'll yeah. be the easier one yeah. for me. Um, and then tell me about the, the products that it sounds like you kind of mass buy. Are they domestically made or are they, you know, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, they're domestic companies. Well, um, they have domestic representation. They have U.S., you know, uh, uh, divisions. Uh, the the uh, Cobra heads, which are the primary product we'd be buying, they are, uh, they're manufactured in North America. They're made in Mexico. And they uh, uh, are distributed up through the U.S. So um, the four-sided colonials are made in the U.S., uh, but they're all U.S.-based uh, lighting manufacturers. Yeah. And then you mentioned something about a different tariff level with PICO. I didn't quite understand what that means. So the base upgrade, which does not have any advanced controls or even the manual control upgrade, you would be on the same tariff that you're on now. You would just get savings because you're consuming a lot less energy. If you go to the advanced control option, they have another tariff you can go to that actually has, uh, is just cheaper in terms of the rates that are associated with it, so generate some additional savings. And that, that really just came out in the last two to three years, and we were really the first projects to go on to that new tariff with PICO. Excellent, thank you. Yep. Other questions from commissioners? Sure, thanks. Um, so, so in, in this in this area, who are your competitors? Competitors? Well, this is all through DVRPC, so it's really they develop the program. Um, I guess theoretically, there's other companies that try to sell directly to municipalities, but we're not coming across those. That some of that occurred five, ten years ago, but all the municipalities, when they've seen the value proposition of, that DVRPC put together, they're just getting on board with. DBRPC, so, um, yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now you, so you install the LED lights. Who, who does the maintenance? So the program will, uh, we've, so we've run, once I was selected or once Keystone was selected, we ran RFPs through DBRPC. So they're actually 
the procurement agent via Chapter 19 of the Pennsylvania Procurement Act, they've done the procurement efforts that you can now piggyback off of. As part of that effort, they procured installation services. And so for uh, this round that you'd be part of, it's Armour and Sons out of Langhorne, uh, Pennsylvania. They're the selected, they went through a competitive process to win that. So um, DBRPC through, through the program, uh, that's who would be used for installation. In terms of maintenance, uh, that's up to you who you want to use. You can use who you have been using. I will tell you though that all of these LED products have 10 year warranties on them. Your current, if you were to replace a current existing fixture, it has a one year warranty. That's a reflection of the life. Uh, so there's gonna be very, very little to no maintenance on these products for, for many years. Um, you, you also get a one year product and labor warranty from Armour and Sons, the installer. So for the first year, there, there's nothing to do. And then for 10 years, you've got the product warranty still standing uh, behind it. Um, but you're probably using maintenance contractors currently. Um, and once the Armour warranty goes out, if you do have any failures and you want them to uh, access the product warranty, you could use that same uh, contractor that you have been. Right. Um, and then I know in, in, in Ward 6, there's some neighborhoods that are in discussions about replacing some of those poles you, you, you mm -hmm. showed, the 10 foot wood poles, um, and, and look to do something a little higher. Um, how, how, how do you deal with that? Because you said it's like for like, but what if that neighborhood or that association is looking to upgrade their utility poles? Yeah, the, uh, the wood poles, that's actually a very, that uh, application is a little atypical that you currently have in here. Those wood poles are usually used with a decorative four-sided colonial fixture, and you can just have a, uh, a bracket come off of that existing pole, and then you have your new uh, four-sided colonial fixture. You know, I have not gone out to look at them yet. They look to be fairly, they look to be a little more than 10 foot poles, but I'm not. They might be 14 feet. If they are, then there's no need for a pole replacement. You could just uh, put a new, more decorative style uh, luminaire on that pole. Okay, but what if they are looking to replace the pole? You know, we, we can handle that through our program. It's a much more expensive change to do that. Um, once you get into replacing poles, it's very expensive. Everything with our program has been very focused on getting the best return on investment. Most municipalities are doing it to to get the savings at a reasonable cost. Um, but we've, we've quoted other municipalities to replace poles. We've done it in small numbers. For South Coatesville, we had a similar application and we actually put in decorative uh, poles in that case. So w in phase two, we can look at it, we can price it out, we can show you what that would look like. And there'll be plenty of options all the way from maybe using the existing pool to looking at something different. And then you would just have to decide what what you're interested in. All right, thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Raleigh? Um, sure. The uh, uh, option, the three options, the, the middle option, what is that giving you? It's kind of, think of it as a little, uh, it, it's a dimmer inside of the light fixture. And the reason we call it a manual control is because it's, it's only, you can go up to the fixture after the fact and change the light level if you need to. But you only really want to do that, let's say, if you have an accident in an intersection and you want to increase light levels or there's some other reason that you want to change light levels. But it takes a bucket truck to get to it right. to make that change. There's costs. So it's, it's just a nice, very low cost adder to the project to have some future flexibility to make adjustments. But it's not necessarily easy to make those adjustments. Whereas the advanced control system, you're making changes through a computer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on that, um, say so you have the three options, which one is the most common? In round three, where we had um, nine municipalities, and our, we're, we're running out of municipalities to do in the area, so we've gone from like 35 to 26 to nine, and you know this round is like five. So of those nine, uh, five of them did the advanced control system. Yeah. In the earlier rounds, Fewer did them, but I, it's because we had to work the price down on it, and it was it was too expensive initially when it was offered okay. back in like round one. Yeah. And then uh, last question: the the four the four sided panels. Yep. Um, the ones at Villanova, instead of having panels on them along their sidewalk, 
It's just open. Yep. Is is that that uh, would be an option? Okay. Yep. Is it good, bad, or otherwise? Uh, I think it looks a little more contemporary, modern when you do that. And most municipalities just most municipalities say, "I just want what I had before, but more efficient and a little nicer, not as you know degraded." So we tend to go back with these with the lenses on the side. But uh, I think pretty sure our pricing's exactly the same whether you do it with the shields or without the or the lenses or uh, completely open. But it's an option. All right. Thanks. Commissioner um, Farhi. Thank you. So just following up with you, Jim, um, those you you want the glass on there because if it's a filament, it is really blinding when you're driving and you it's get going up though. Yeah, like you get those spots. Uh, yeah, I'll just tell you, but you, you get those spots in your eyes, so you do need some kind of protection, uh, like a frosted glass to protect you from the filament. Um, can you just talk to me real quick? I have a, I'm going to go two directions. This is the first one real quick. Light spillage. Um, do these have typically, you know, are they right on the street? Um, mm. You know, especially uh, I am in a very high density neighborhood right. where there's always a ton of light. Um, and then ambient light from, you know, from the hospital or going over or whatever you look out and sometimes, especially when it's raining, there's this plume. Yeah. Um, so are these going to add uh, really, how much are they going to add? You know, we had a dark skies, right? We've asked some yep. of our institutional neighbors for dark skies ordinance. W where are you with yep. that in the light spillage there? Yeah. So this older uh, this is what we call a sag lens, mm -hmm. and light comes out the side of this. What we put in for Cobra heads are cutoff fixtures, and so 100% of the light goes down. So there, it's dark sky compliant in, in that sense. They're also more controllable. So this, you know, generally kind of lets light spread out a little bit more. I mean, they still try to control, you know, if it's on the roadway or if it's supposed to be more of a round coverage, uh, LEDs are really controllable. So you actually, like behind the fixture, you'll just see it cut off right on, you know, right about the sidewalk, and it usually doesn't go further but, behind it. Sure, but the yeah. LEDs will have that more plume when there's uh, water particle vapor in the air, correct? Uh, I, I haven't noticed that as much. I mean, they are, they are bright, um, and so some people will comment on the brightness. Some like that, some do not. You know, uh, but it's, um, we've been looking at your, it's, it's interesting, I'm try, already starting to look at the second phase of design, looking at some of your mix of what you currently have. You're generally a pretty low lit municipality. I'm not saying that's bad or good, but our standard design levels may actually be a little too high for you. So we have done this for other municipalities and actually brought them down a little bit. Um, and, so there's, there's lots of options to really get things dialed in. Can you go to the slide where you had the three options? The financial slide? There you go. So um, the total, let's just say that we go with the platinum plan for the 922. Right? Mm -hmm. um, is that one byte or is that over how many years or, or what is the... How do we, as a township and a, and a tax base, pay for it? Uh, Commissioner, if yeah. I may, uh, yeah, who's as that? part of Bob. the uh, as yeah. part of the um, oh. our building and infrastructure improvement plan, uh, we presented back in uh, the second meeting in February. Uh -huh. I gave you an overview of that and the ten million ten million dollar borrowing associated with that. This is a component of that project, so it would be paid for the bond out of the bond proceeds. So it would be paid over 10 years or 15 years, correct? However long that bond is. Correct, yes. Okay. okay. Um, and then the, the, the final question I have is, um, I, I don't know if it's possible or if we'd even do anything, but would it be possible to put some kind of solar panels above some of these, maybe these telephone poles? I know that Jake, they have those pizza boxes for your um, cell phone, you know, your cell tower things, whatever. Could you put, uh, is that a, uh, 
I don't know, is that a synergy there? Uh, would it work? I mean, I don't, the LEDs don't use a lot of energy. So could you charge or charge some of it with the solar? And if so, um, would that knock some of that uh, 922 or, or, I'm sorry, I don't know how much it would cost per year. What would it cost per year? 100,000 a year or nine? Yeah, I mean, it's if if that's a that's a non-financed amount that I'm yeah. showing there. And as a matter of fact, the your initial outlay would be over a million, but then you get 107,000 back in um, in uh, in rebates. That's why you get this net 922. Yeah, so it's 922 plus plus or minus five percent. Yeah, right. Paid, paid off. Right. So. Uh, we have not done any solar on it. These, you know, almost those 1,100 uh, street lights are hooked to Pico. Sure. And they're interested in providing you power to that light. And uh, their tariff really doesn't accommodate additional accessories like that, especially things that might power and reduce the power that they're providing. So uh, okay. our goal is to just I mean, get. If it didn't use it, it could go right back to the grid, right? Yeah, it's, it's, we've never done that. It's, we don't. Okay. I don't think it would be allowed under the tariff. I mean, uh, yeah. It just seems like wasted space, but. Yeah. Okay. Our, our, well, at <laughs> least our goal is that, you know, I, I anticipate for your project, we're typically in that 50 to 70% energy reduction. Uh, it may even be more because of my comment about your light levels being a little lower, which may cause us to go a little lower with our uh, LED wattages. So, I mean, once we're getting down to below like a 30 watt LED, for a street light, that's really, really low. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's why I'm saying you could have a yeah. very low power source right. powering some of it. If you use, you know, in the winter, you may need to supplement it. In the summer, you may be able to give some of that back to the grid. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Yeah. Mr. Norsini, were you going to make I'm a I'm sorry. Comment? I didn't mean to interrupt, but for Commissioner Farhi, so we're, we're installing solar-powered lights at the South Wayne lot, and it's – a completely different project than this. So there's actually batteries at the base of these lights. So you would have to replace every pole throughout the township with a pole that can accommodate uh, these batteries. Then you have options for how many batteries you want. And uh, so I think it would prob, and I'm just anecdotally gonna tell you, it would triple or quadruple the cost of one Cobra head replacement versus you'd have to replace all these poles as you went through. Because like I say, I don't know how you would do it without the base of the pole, decorative or not, houses the batteries and the controller. So it gets to be pretty pricey. Got it. Um, yeah, I just know that we did, you know, we've done a lot of uh, environmental, uh, you know, initiatives like Ready for 100, if this is something not your, but to the board, if that's something that would be in just trying to find a way to help the environment and save the taxpayers. Public. Yeah, I, I will mention, I can't say much about it, but I know DVRPC is also working on a lot of Liz Compatella, who also kind of is the quarterback of this entire program. Uh, I know she's working on a lot of cooperative uh, solar uh, type agreements for trying to get municipalities together, similar to like we did for this program. So, yeah, yeah. Are there any other questions? From commissioners? I think everybody grabbed the questions I had. So okay. I want to thank you for the presentation. All right. Thank um, you. Very much. Thanks. And um, Bob, do you need a, anything from us tonight on this? It's the next it, item, right? The next agenda item is. Oh, sorry. is, is sorry. What, what, yes, thank you. I wasn't, re I wasn't reading my agenda directly. I did do my homework, though. Um, so thank you for that, for the um, presentation, and that'll lead us to Resolution 2023-39, which is authorizing cooperative purchasing and participation in the Regional Streetlight Procurement Program administered by the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission and to proceed with Phase 2 of the program in the amount of $36,016. Um, now that we're voting on moving forward, I will open it again to... Um, Discussion by commissioners. You can make a motion. Let's make a motion to, and a second. Second. Okay. And I open it for further discussion. I will start it and say I think it's fabulous, and um, the price for 
the um, next phase seems to be uh, reasonable and I think it'll bring great savings to our community. It um, also reflects our commitment to our ready, to one, ready for 100 and other environmental activities. Um, so it's gonna get my vote if anyone else would like to comment. Bob, will this 36,000 come out of the, the bond? This would be part of the bond proceeds, correct. Okay, we'll be thanks. reimbursed from the bond. Thanks. Others? I will ask for any public comment. Sarah Pelling, 29 Garrett Avenue. Uh, as a person who lives on a street with very few street lights that are very dull, um, I think it's wonderful to do it. I think the cost saving is terrific. I think it's a lesson to the community when it's accomplished that shows that small steps get you long places. And so I, for $36,000, go. Other comments from community members? I will call the vote. All in favor say aye. Thank you very much. This is exciting. And we are moving on now to the resolution 2023-37, which is authorizing the award of the contract for the design and construction services of the Malin Road Sanitary Sewer Extension to Gannett Fleming Incorporated in the amount of $59,264 to be funded from the Sanitary Sewer Fund. Mr. Norsini. Thank you, Commissioner. <clears throat> so I think some folks are here in the audience for this, uh, but on Malin Road, basically between Spring House and Barron, there's folks that are, we don't have public sewer and their systems are failing. And uh, we, we wanna try to accommodate them as well as the rest of the folks in that area. So we're proposing to do a design to connect to an existing manhole on Barron, on Malin Road above Spring House and also go up Malin and take a left onto Barron just to the houses in our township. So the proposal before you tonight is to perform that design. There's considerable topographic survey involved with that. Uh, you know, first floor elevations of houses, uh, determining the route of the sewer line, determining who can go on via gravity versus who would have to pump, uh, bidding documents, <clears throat> excuse me, and the, the, the bidding administration that comes with that. So the idea would be to get this proposal approved, we're requesting get this proposal approved to design the sewer, and then as a part of that design, we'll know a cost. And then we can meet with the residents to determine what the cost per lot would be and that would be an assessment and the time the town the township pardon me actually finances the work and uh we provide that as a loan to the resident and they pay it back over time so this would be step one to determine we're skipping over feasibility we're not going to do feasibility we're just going to go right to design that's the the, uh, the request to determine what it would cost then we would meet with the residents obtain the buy-in, hopefully, of everybody that wants to get on this, uh, on public sewer. We, we like them to be on public sewer. DEP likes them to be on public sewer, and it's better for them. So, if so approved by the board, the design would start, we would get all this work done, look at those numbers, and then meet with the residents to go over the costs of what that assessment would be. And the costs include design, estimated construction cost, estimated legal costs through the solicitor's office for, for the agreements uh, and inspections and a contingency. Um, thank you. I'm going to uh, ask for a motion to approve before we have a discussion. So moved. And a second. second. Okay. Um, I have some questions and I know that we want to hear from some residents too, but um, how many houses are we talking about, Mr. Norsini? I believe there's nine. And can you tell us um, the sort of the criteria for where the township takes on costs for 
um, sewer hookup and managing sewer systems for residents and when a resident must um, sort of take on some of the sure so cost uh, throughout for all townships whenever a sewer main extension is done which is what this is uh, I've done them in the past here and in previous lives so the residents are assessed for those costs and it's either assessed as we say by the EDU which is the house or front footage of the property and that usually comes into play if a property can be subdivided so for something like this for any sewer extension all the costs create what the assessment is so design anticipated construction costs inspection costs legal fees all that that becomes one large number divided by nine and let's say for the sake of this I have no idea what it would be for the sake of this discussion that's twelve thousand dollars so we meet with those nine homeowners as, as many times as they wish answer all their questions and where this project is it installs the sanitary main that's always owned and operated by the township we own it we maintain it and we would run laterals right that's the service pipe that comes from your house to the main we would run them to a predetermined location like five feet behind the curb or whatever so the homeowner would incur the cost of their share of this project and like I say the, the usual means is the township pays for it and then we offer financing to that resident over a 10 or 15 year period at the current interest rates I've talked to Mr. Tate about that to get those exact numbers then it is the residents cost solely to connect to the lat lateral pipe that we run and you might say well why don't you include it all well it's because in some cases connecting to the system is relatively inexpensive in that it's a, a, a four or six inch gravity line that comes from the house and the cost really at that point is just dependent on length but some of these lots are low lying and may require a grinder pump to pump up to it so instead of trying to homogenize all these different costs and throw it into the project which really isn't equitable because person a might have to spend fifteen thousand dollars to connect because they're using the grinder pump while person B might only have to spend eight so those costs are solely on them when we do this if this all were to go through there is another requirement so basically everybody who fronts the sewer has to connect it's not um, it's not an option because then the prices get skewed so if there's nine lots and only four people want to connect we've more than doubled their cost and then I, I think the solicitor would chime in and say then as every homeowner came on in the future we actually have to reimburse those folks because they've they've paid all this so it, it becomes an all or none proposition uh, which in, and I, you know that so in the weeds some people say well hey I just redid my system I don't want to do this I just spent 20,000 on my on-site system so all this has to be taken into consideration and we would meet with the residents you know in person as many times as they need to answer all their questions but that all has to happen after this design is done so we can give them real world numbers based on it then the only variable is the bidding climate and we'll be very conservative with what the estimated construction costs are because as you've seen through our bids sometimes they come in favorable and sometimes they're less favorable but that would all then that would all just get passed on through to the residents so in general terms municipalities want to have their folks on public sewer the Department of Environmental Protection wants people to be on public sewer because failed systems that's no good for the environment right and, and going into the soil like that so in general it's a good thing to do uh, but there are costs associated so my request to this board from the engineering department is to allow us to do this design come up with all these costs and meet with the residents and and, and flesh this out through them thank you for that um, explanation um, are there other are there other neighborhoods that are in that are similarly situated that you're working with now or 
Is so this we, a unique area to the township? Uh, in Commissioner Meyer's neighborhood, we just got an email last week. There are some folks interested in looking at what public sewer would be like. Uh, we get, we haven't met yet, but I will meet with the commissioner and, and two or three of her constituents to, re, to go over this same process I just outlined to you. Uh, we did have some folks on Roberts and Vauclain who were interested, but in the end they decided not to do it. That was, that was their call. But we needed to go through the design exercise to give them those numbers and to determine if they wanted to. So that there are pockets of the community there that are still on on site. Sometimes it's a single lot here or there. Other times they're little enclaves of homes that were never sewered when they were originally constructed. Are there any other questions? Yeah, I have, I have a couple. Uh, sorry, I had to step out. So, um, real quick. So, do we have the capacity for uh, for this or not? So that that's going to be another part of the piece of the puzzle is. Uh, working with the downstream. So usually this falls on the developer. Now it will fall on us to get those approvals. So I will be in their seat for a while to try to get this, but that would all be part of it. Uh, so it's, it's I tell every resident, <clears throat> you know, if the board were to approve everything today, you're looking at well over a year and a half or so before anything even occurs between the design and then the permitting and trying to make sure we get this downstream approval. But this is really the most important first step to give the residents an idea of what this is going to cost. I, uh, I can add briefly to that also. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That uh, when, when it's failing systems like this, if it's documented failing systems, the DEP will consider that a facility of public need and they'll jump step their approval process for that specifically. Um, and then the other question, too, is um, if a homeowner is forced, and I don't know if you spoke to these nine, if there's consensus with these nine, for or against, um, but if you are forcing a homeowner to attach to the sewer, there's going to be disruption of their property. It's forced, um, forced disruption of their property. You're installing something probably well within, well past that easement. Um, to a certain extent, I view this as eminent domain, pretty much, basically, because you're, you're going in and taking a, a part of someone's property. They may not be able to see it. It may be underground. So, Commissioner, yeah. the, the sewer would be in the street. First off, let me back but, up. But you would still no, need to connect. But nobody to, is forced, nobody is forced to do this, right? Nobody is forced to do this. I thought this. you said that they would be for, like that they would. Well, no, be it's an all or none proposition, but it, everybody has a choice, yes or no. So the sewer itself, the big, the main that we would run, an eight inch pipe underground, uh -huh. would be in Malin Road and in Barron Road. So we're not on anybody's property. The laterals we would run yeah. would just poke behind the curb like five feet. So we, we the township, would not be disturbing their property. It's up to that homeowner to connect to that lateral. That's where the disturbance comes. And number one, we also, most standards are, you have, you, you set a timeline to connect. You say, you, you know, if we're gonna do this, you must connect within a year or 18 months. That's the, about the longest I've seen. So if we go through this study, we come up to costs and we meet with everybody, and a bunch of folks don't want to do it, that, that's their prerogative, and may, maybe maybe the project doesn't go through. Sure, okay, so let's say you have eight of nine people that want to do it and one person doesn't. You're not going to force that one person to connect, correct? I, I wouldn't force them, Commissioner. That would be up to you folks. Got it. So this board you, you could do force have an ordinance then, so that then, so You do, the, you do yeah, have so an ordinance that requires anyone within 150 feet to connect to well, the public it's, it's, sure. as far as I'm concerned, it's a, I mean, so if you have to put a line that connects their house from their house or change your line, which their septic tank may be in the backyard, but now you need to run a line that goes underneath their front yard to connect to the sewer and you're forcing them to do that, correct? I mean, to me, that's what I view as eminent domain. You are taking 
someone's property. So not to step on our solicitor's to, toes, but eminent domain is when we take the property well, to do a public are, works project. Well, you are. You're forcing them. Yes. No, so there would be no. Uh, you can. You no, can Commissioner, say, there would be no township easement on anybody's property. These are their person, their private laterals that connect. And at one but point. you're forcing them to connect. At one point, we would have to look at the number of folks that do or don't want to do it, and a decision would have to be made, maybe for the greater good, to install it if there's a couple folks that don't want to, or perhaps the project sure. doesn't go away. But I do want to make sure you understand there is no eminent domain here. We would be working all within the township right away. But if you're forcing them to connect and they have to connect to the sewer, then they would have to dig something in their uh, in their front yard, possibly, to connect. I mean, you're forcing them to do that one way or another. Then maybe it's, uh, uh, maybe it's a passive uh, form but, of that. But like right Roger here. said, we have, a, a, we have an ordinance like most other municipalities that say if you're within X feet I, 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 of a line, that, you, need, fine. you need to connect. That's fine. I'm just saying I don't like telling someone that they have to connect. That's my point. I mean, you can call it eminent domain, passive or not, but if you're forcing a homeowner to do something that they don't want to do with their property and it's not a street sign, this is digging up their property, it's an expensive venture, yeah, I'm a... Uh, we don't dig up their property. No, they dig up their property. Right. They're, and I, they're forced to dig up so their property. So we have residents here, and we will get to hear from them, um, but I want to continue this discussion uh, before I ask for public comment. But this has been... And Mr. Narsini, you can you can jump in here. But this has been a conversation that's been ongoing with neighbors for uh, how long? This is pre-COVID that we talked. Um, so this is we were trying to go through different iterations of someone else constructing it. You know, like a developer, and like a developer would for a subdivision, and and working out different things. Uh, that never gained traction. So. The, the process I laid out is, is the standard, is the normal way to do it. Uh, I understand Commissioner Farhee's concern. Again, I want to make sure everybody knows there is no eminent domain as part of this project. That's not a term to be used no, here. No, it, it, it's not the correct legal term, but you are forcing a homeowner to do something with their property that they may not want to do. And sorry, Steve, to interrupt, but I don't care that this is before COVID or not. Unless there is 100% consensus from these homeowners to force them, and I don't know their situation, I don't know if they're on a fixed income or they lost their job, these things are th thousands and thousands of dollars. It's a disruption. They hit a pipe. Who knows their homeowner's gonna pay for it? It's an issue, and it's, uh, it's a big issue and to the homeowner. Um, you know. So don't forget, by the township financing this over a period of years, it makes it much more affordable to to the residents, right? They're not having to pony up. They're able to to, to spread these costs over 10 or 15 years uh, well, for something that will actually make the property values increase. Because if you ever looked at a house and it says on-site sewer, that's not a benefit to your sale, right? Public and, sewer, and, public and water. And to that point, if I could add, from a homeowner's perspective, if you have a failing on lot system, you can't sell that house to a buyer that is going to get a mortgage on that house because no lender will ever lend money uh, in a mortgage uh, market to a failing on lot system. So the the homeowners that have failing systems are restricted from selling their homes. Uh, yeah, I, I'll just say this last. So I don't care if you slice it up over 30 years or 10 years. It's a big number, period. It's, you know, 10, 20,000 plus. And who knows what, how their front yard is configured. And you're not going to be reimbursing them for anything. And then when you talk about how it's good for the property values, great. I think it's great if it helps the property values. Although there are some people here and some people, um, as we do this comprehensive plan, that want to see the property values essentially, I don't want to say go down, but there's not enough affordable housing. So million dollar homes that become more valuable because of this kind of, I'm all for that side of it. I'm just not for um, for telling a homeowner that they have to spe uh, pay an exorbitant amount of money unless it's consensus with whatever nine homes or whatever block it is. I'll just finish with, 
we won't know any costs until unless we do the design so everything is anecdotal at this point if we do the design we have hard numbers and we have something to talk to people about but I, I'll leave it at that um, again I know we're gonna hear from um, residents who can speak personally but we're not um, able to engage with them the way I can with you. So I'm going to ask you, have you um, any understanding about are there failed systems in this neighborhood? Are people struggling with the uh, with I, it? Subject? As far as I know, I believe there's three or four failed systems. And um, do you have any, have you been able to engage uh, with residents? And if so, do you have a sense about um, whether or not this would be a unanimous choice by them? So, Commissioner, I've only talked to the folks that I know have the failed systems, and I think they're, I think a few of them are here, and I think they very much want to get on. And I'll add that what is a working system today may be a failed system tomorrow, right? So, even though somebody has a, you know, operational on site system, at one point that system will have to be replaced. And better to spend my opinion my humble opinion better to spend better to spend that money on connecting to public sewer and being done with it than replacing that system and then replacing it again you know in 20 years or so forth so i don't have a gauge uh, but we we won't have anything concrete to speak of unless we do a design um, and let's say we don't do the design and um, we leave the residents kind of to manage each of them to manage their own property. What happens when a system fails? Okay. Is it, does it intrude beyond their So, so what's typically property? done is when, it, when a system uh, completely fails uh, and whether it's the health department or the DEP determines that that's completely failed, they'll place that residence on a holding tank. So they'll construct have to construct a tank basically in their front yard somewhere accessible to a pumper truck and a pumper truck will have to come service that house uh, every couple of days until the system is rectified whenever that is. So what happens today, the rules have changed the distance between an on-site system and a well and, and distance from an on-site system to the house have changed since most of these houses have been built. So if they were to apply to do their new system, this could also cause a lot of other issues as to where it's placed, um, the size of it, and if your ground, which I believe applies to one or two of these, no longer is able to infiltrate, they have to use an experimental system or a, uh, or a sand mound none of which are the, the, like a sand mound is literally what I just said. It is a big mound in your backyard of, of sand covered with grass that sewage is pumped up into and drained down into. So these aren't great options for the folks that have failed systems if their lots are in bad shape. Thank you. And having a, a distinct memory of needing to call in the truck to pump a septic on the morning of my brother's wedding, um, I can attest to how bad it can be uh, when it does fail. But um, are there any other uh, questions for Mr. Norsini? Jim, do you want to? One more question. Yeah, of course. Um, so what is the cost? Um, you said that you'd let them hook up after a year. A, uh, could you extend it maybe to five years for the hookup? Uh, is that something that and I know the board votes on it, but is that something that has been done in the past? I've never done anything that long, but I think we could discuss, and I, I truly think a lot of the questions you're asking will be answered if we're able to do this design and we're able to talk to everybody <clears throat> and give them context and background. And then we can see, because somebody may have a perfectly fine system that's 20 years old, and then I can tell them, you only have so many years left on that system. So, that's my next so mm -hmm. instead of in two, three, four years spending all on your own with no assistance from the township to replace that system, think about joining in and connecting and you're done with that. that that's my question. So it does a, a cost benefit analysis of if you have a system and you have 10 more years, so what it would cost or five more years to replace that system 
uh, there's almost like an amortization, and then as opposed yeah, to I would just say up. I would wait to see what people say, but I I, I wouldn't extend it too far. Okay, and we are going to get to hear from the, the resident. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If the commissioners are done with uh, questions, Jim? Uh, yeah, I'm fine. I, I understand the system. So I just want to hear from the public. Thanks. Absolutely. Great. Um, then I will move on to public comment. I'd invite any of the residents up. Good evening. My name is Rick Yeager. I live at 350 Malin Road, and I am uh, a proud owner of a failed system. Um, and, and as it goes right now, my property, the property and everything in question, my system's fine as far as the, uh, the tank. It's the leaching field that becomes compromised and has to be replaced every so many years. Um, in addition to that, the soil conditions in the area have deteriorated and become uh, basically accumulated what they call an interrupting layer under the soil that, per that uh, prohibits the ground from percolating and water from seeping into the ground. So in, in a, what they've done and what Steve referred to as an experimental system is they've created uh, different systems that are actually more toward the surface of the ground and they spread the water that's coming out of the septic tank over a larger area to hopefully dis, dis, uh, you know, to be spread out in the soil. Obviously in the winter, they freeze and they become inoperable. And, and even the sand mounds are, are well above the frost level of the, of, that we have in our township and in the area. So they are experimental, they, are, they work to a certain extent, and they're also probably about two times more costly than putting in a conventional um, leaching field. Um, so it just, it, it makes perfect sense in this case, in our, in our area, we're in, that, we're in a corner of uh, the township where town, uh, areas on either side of us up in um, uh, Mayland, up further into Marple Township and going up Barron Road into Newtown Township where they have the sewer coming right up pretty much close to the township line. There are neighbors in, in the, our area here that uh, are already connected to a, sept, a, a sewer line um, that is uh, close to us, which is why the manhole is, is accessible. Um, at this point, you know, like I said, I think speaking as a resident and, you know, in, in a difficult situation right now, um, at my, my particular property, in fact, is one that during springtime, spring thaw, and, and when we get the rainy weather that we've been getting recently, um, my property is literally a marsh. So the, the experimental system really isn't going to go anywhere. It's just going to add to the water that's marsh. So, you know, at this point, you know, I'm really in need of getting this sewer line run and functional. Um, I think it's a matter of common, uh, nowadays, kind of a common uh, decency and, and human health, uh, you know, just something that, that makes sense. At this point, I just ask the board to go ahead and approve at least the cost study that Steve has proposed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, other residents want to speak to this, or okay? Hello, I'm Donna Delala Melton, two thirty one Barron Road. We live on a corner property. Uh, my dad bought the lot, built the house, so the Delalas have been paying Radnor taxes for well over 65 years. I don't know if it's gonna be financially feasible for us because we don't, we don't have a lot of wealth, but I think we need to look at it because we're gonna to need to do something soon as well. And why do something that again is temporary 
and maybe my children, if they own the house, or you know, are going to have to be here where we're standing now. I'd ra I think we should at least see what the cost would be. I agree. I don't think anyone should be made to do anything with their property. And if we all don't agree, then we can't agree. But I think we should be a, at least able to see, since most of the neighbors here have been here for a while, we've been paying taxes for, to Radnor before Radnor is what it is now because of the people who first moved here and paid those taxes. And I think we deserve the opportunity to see if we can tie into a sewer as well. But I do agree, no one should be made to do anything. That's just not fair. Thank you for the time. Excellent. Uh, any other comments from the, from the public? Um, I really appreciate the, um, the information that you've given, Mr. Norsini, um, this is, you know, a section of my ward. I've um, talked to Mr. Yeager a couple of times. I've tried to understand the situation. Um, I am very much in favor of getting the um, uh, getting this design done uh, for the very reason. There's no, there's going to be no understanding of what um, impact this would have financially on the residents until. We know what it would cost, and it's really hard to get people to say that they are on board when they have no understanding of what kind of cost it would take. So, um, you know, I don't, you know, $59,000 is nothing to sneeze at, but this is, um, you know, an investment into the betterment of a, a corner of the township that's in need. And um, I am very much, um, obviously, I'm going to vote yes. I'm very much in support of this, and I would ask my fellow commissioners to join me in approving this. I have a point of order, because um, there's only three people up here. So if four people don't, four, four correct. But if, if I vote no, and you, there's only three, does it still pass? Or do you need the majority of, do you need yes. the majority, I need it's of, majority the of the quorum? OK, it's a majority of the quorum, OK. Anyway, that is my um, my pitch for um, asking you to vote yes on this um, resolution. Not seeing any other comment. Um, and did I move it? <laughs> I don't think so. I'm gonna I'm gonna move to approve, and I'll ask for a second. Okay, thank you. And um, Commissioner Myers, another comment. I just had a quick question for Mr. Norsini. Um, would this sixty thousand dollars, we'll call it. Um, get design costs get put into this nine house neighborhood fund? Yes, yeah, so the design costs are rolled into this. Um, that's any cost associated with the project. Thanks, I assume so, I just wasn't sure. Okay, um, thank you. I, do you have any, I, you're looking like you have a comment or you just no, waiting to vote? vote? Okay. Then I am going to call the vote. All in favor say aye. aye. And opposed? Thank you all. It'll get you started. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate you being here um, as one of the last items. And um, thank you, Mr. Norsini, for getting Can us I just say, I, I would not have voted for this, but I, I appreciate what you had to say. Okay, so um, our next item is resolution 2023-40, which is authorizing the award of the contract for the design of the cornerstone basin drainage improvements to Meliora Design in the amount of $30,299 to be funded from the stormwater fund. Mr. Norsini. Thank you, Commissioner. So I'm gonna have to take us back a couple of years to the Radnor Tap Trail. Everybody's familiar with the piece that runs around the high school but there is actually a piece off of Bryn Mawr Avenue that starts at Bryn Mawr Avenue and runs behind the cornerstone development to Haverford Township. We needed an easement to get this uh, piece of trail in, the paved trail that goes all the way back. So our agreement with the Cornerstone Homeowners Association to get this easement was to address a stream that starts, uh, well, for, for the purpose of this, there's a stream that comes from the other side of Bryn Mawr Avenue that uh, I looked back on the old development plans that ran nicely into the basin and you know, was, was addressed by the basin. Over time, 
this stream has completely silted in. And what's happening is it's causing some of the uh, homes in the Cornerstone development, it's making their backyards very swampy. It's not draining. And that's on a normal day. When we get a big rain, it's, it's even worse. So uh, to live up to our agreement, to do that work, we need to get, it's actually, uh, hate to say this, it's a joint permit. So it's an Army Corps of Engineers and DEP permit because we're touching a stream and we're in the wetlands. And this has actually created more wetlands because it's not draining anywhere. So the, the request to the, the board tonight is to award Meliora the design and permitting contract uh, for this stream to get it cleaned out, rerouted, and, and it's, it includes quite a bit. There's a wetland staking that has to take place because it's a joint permit. There's a topographical survey, and then there would be the design and bidding documents to do this work. And that's what's before you tonight, solely for the design and permitting. The largest part of the contract is the permitting portion. Thank you. I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to make a motion to approve and ask for a second. Second. Okay. Um, my, so my first question, to be clear, this is a commitment that we made in order to get an easement. Is that right? That is correct. So without this easement, that last considerable lengthy piece of trail into Haverford Township would not have been built. And during all our, you know, if we look at various open space and greenway plans, this is a part of that to get to Haverford Township, right? I mean, theirs isn't improved yet, but we hope it will be, but you can still walk through there. And we, we would not have been able to have this trail constructed if we did not get this easement from the Homeowners Association. Are there any other questions from commissioners? And is there any uh, public comment on this issue? All in favor say aye. aye. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to our final business item, which is a motion to authorize the township manager to sign township participation documents for Teva, CVS, Walmart, Allergen, and Walgreen opioid settlements. Um, uh, just as a, a background, this is phase two. This is a settlement with part of the pharmacies uh, that are out there. And just to give you background, back in 2021, we had signed a resolution uh, for the phase one, uh, which was a resolution authorizing the execution of two settlement participation forms uh, for uh, the drug companies. So there was originally a class action suit uh, that was filed because of the opioid uh, epi uh, epidemic. Um, and we were part of a settlement program. Uh, this program was, as townships signed up, it was to get more money paid into the county. And how it works is the settlement proceeds are all paid directly to the county. The county administers uh, the funds and distributes them for specific purposes and those specific purposes are for uh, drug and mental health programs uh, throughout all of the county. Um, right now with the phase one, uh, we were awarded, the county was awarded 56 million that was going to be paid over 18 years. Uh, currently in our account, the county account is 6.45 million. Uh, phase two uh, with the pharmacies, it is a settlement of 30, 4.8 million over a 10 to 15 year period. Uh, the legal fees have not been taken out of that, but it's pretty much that amount. So um, as the last one, um, all we're asking for is to participate in something that we're not actually getting direct funds for, but if we do not participate in it, um, then the funding is reduced to the county. And so you know, we were part of the phase one first. We're, they are asking us to be part of the phase two, um, and that is authorizing uh, Bill White to go ahead and sign those participation forms that allows the county to get more funding. Um, thank you for that. I have, do have a question. What happens if we don't sign on to it? Is a, how is the county affected if we don't? Uh, their amount of money is going to be reduced. So it is a let's call it a penalty. 
And um, so to be clear, no money would come directly to Radnor, but this is Radnor supporting the county's efforts to um, accept the settlement and put those funds into programs and initiatives serving um, drug and alcohol and mental health um, Right, issues. so no funds are being paid directly to the township. However, the township is going to benefit from those funds uh, because the county will administrate them and be putting up programs that hopefully will aid our township. Excellent. Other questions from commissioners? Yeah, I have, yeah, just one quick question. So while we won't feel, because we don't have any of those programs in this township, uh, and I'm, I'm guessing the answer is no, we can't direct or ask uh, the townships that we border, say Havertown or Newtown, to say, look, we don't have any, any, uh, you know, any um, services or whatever that, that could use that money, but these townships do, uh, could you, you know, if you kind of, if you help them, that would help us because it's at least a proximity issue with some of our residents. Um, I don't know if any programs are here. Um, and I would be assuming that if those programs are up, they would benefit anybody who would go in those programs. And I don't know if they would be township specific saying you have to live in this township. I don't think it would be. I would think that it's because it's county based um, that they're providing the money that anybody could go in where those programs are for any of the drug or mental health issues. Other questions, comments? Um, is there any um, comment from the, uh, uh, is there any public comment? So I'm gonna make the motion to authorize uh, the township manager to sign. May I get a second? So, and all in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you very much. That uh, concludes our business agenda and I'm going to turn to uh, reports of our board liaisons. Um, anybody wanna report on a, a committee or, or board? Commissioner Farhi? It's all yours. Yeah, thanks. I, I have something to say. Um, thank you, Commissioner Moroni. Um, and this is to the people at home. This is uh, a parks and rec issue, but I think it's a, a greater issue with the township. And I, I want to say that this board and the people up here, we don't always get it right the first time, but I want to say that our staff works tirelessly. They work around the clock some seven days a week uh, to see the projects and the events that make Radnor great. Uh, happen and um, many uh, staff members uh, and and my and a few of my colleagues um, or many of the staff members have given uh, me and I'm sure a few of my colleagues their phone numbers and they've told me hey call me anytime including three o'clock in the morning so I really want to say that that really sets um, it just it just shows how dedicated certain members or really all of our staff is to our commissioners, uh, the people up here, as well as their residents. Um, throughout my time up here, I've seen staff, um, our, de our department heads, do a lot more with less and less. They have less money. Uh, they may have less, uh, our directors may have less staff under them, and they have uh, uh, more projects on their plate. And some of these are just absolutely, it, it, it boggles my mind what some of our staff is able to do with the the, the resources that they have. Um, a couple years ago, I was kind of touched uh, by something of what uh, Michelle Obama said. She said, if you see something, say something. I think um, that's important. Um, so it, it's hard for me to be quiet and, and um, not bring something up, and I'm not gonna use any names for anything. Um, but I, I feel that when, look, us, we as a board, we're elected. You know, if people want to come and take shots at us, this is what we signed up for. But when staff members, um, people that are basically private citizens that just happen to work in the public sector, get attacked, um, and they may or, and these, these people may or may not be able to defend themselves, or they may not want to. They may have too much class to do. The, to defend themselves. Um, 
I think it says a lot about them because uh, they're not going to um, get into the weeds with it. Um, I do feel that it is my duty to do so. And when I see certain staff members um, get attacked, I think it's cowardly. And I think it's atrocious. So um, again, I just want to thank our staff members, um, some here, some at home, uh, whether it's our public works, our police, our parks and rec, our finance, thank you for everything that you do. Um, I've been here for six years and I am I'm proud to uh, work with these people and I want to say in general, uh, our staff does an excellent job and uh, I am, uh, it's always been an honor for me to be up here. So uh, that means a lot. Um, on a other note, I do want to say uh, regarding Parks and Rec, um, there's going to be a meeting on Thursday. So uh, we're going to talk about Fenimore Woods, which is an interesting segue. And, uh, and we're also going to be talking about the dogs as well. So it's going to be a, a jam-packed agenda. We hope that you're out. I'm sure that you will be. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you on Thursday. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm not seeing any other um, uh, reports from committees. Um, so I will move to new business. Is there any new business? Is there any old business? Um, I open it up for public participation. Any comments? Not seeing any. I will ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. And a second. All in favor say aye. aye. Thank you.